Good morning, my friends. Pastor Daniel and myself want to welcome you to our Wednesday morning time of prayer and reflection and, and meditation. And today, the topic that we're going to be thinking about, it's a continuation, actually, is around the theme of stewardship. And we also want to welcome today Rick Crago. Rick, thank Hi. you for being here. Uh, Rick and his wife, Zenaida, have been kind of milling around this church since about 1983. Perhaps you've seen him, but we're glad that he's joined us this morning. And he's a career individual in the Air Force and retired from that. And, and so he has lived in many different parts of the world and brings to us some unique perspectives. And hopefully that will also include stewardship in the church. We want to remind all of you to take a look at Musical Gifts of Inspiration, which aired yesterday on Tuesday and tune in on that, it's online, and I know you'll enjoy that. There's a wonderful selection of songs that you can listen to. And so, it's good to be together today, gentlemen. Yes. All right. Good to be here. Pastor Daniel, mm -hmm. let us join together in our call to worship. Let us turn our minds from human things. Our faith in Jesus saves us. Let us set our minds on divine things. Our faith in Jesus saves us. We will deny ourselves and take up our cross. Our faith in Jesus saves us. We will lose all that we may gain all. Our faith in Jesus saves us. Please join with me in prayer. We gather this day on the second portion of our Lenten journey to the cross. Last week we looked at our own readiness to follow Jesus. Yet what about our expectations? We often have fantasies about what lies ahead, picturing ourselves standing lovingly by as Christ heals, basking in the glow of Christ's love and ministry. We expect that once we have said yes to the journey, everything will go very well. Give us a reality check, Lord, Help us to understand that the journey has many twists and turns, hills and valleys. Life is not lived on the plain with everything being equal. Prepare our hearts to look at our expectations and free us from our images of easy ministry so that we can be more effective servants and witnesses for you. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. The reading from the Hebrew Bible is Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 7 and 15 and 16. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Serve me faithfully and live a blameless life. I will make a covenant with you by which I will guarantee to give you countless descendants. At this, Abram fell face down on the earth. Then God said to him, this is my covenant with you. I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. What's more, I am changing your name. It will no longer be Abram. Instead, you will be called Abraham, for you will be the father of many nations. I will make you extremely fruitful. Your descendants will become many nations, and kings will be among them. I will confirm my covenant with you and your descendants after you from generation to generation. This is the everlasting covenant. I will always be your God and the God of your descendants after you. Then God said to Abraham, regarding Sariah, your wife, her name will no longer be Sariah. From now on, her name will be Sarah. And I will bless her and give you a son from her. Yes, I will bless her richly, and she will, she will become the mother of many nations. Kings of nations will be among her descendants. Pastor Daniel and myself will lead in the reading from the Psalter and will be reading responsively. <clears throat> We're reading Psalm 22, verses 23 through 31. Praise the Lord, all you who fear him. Honor him, all you descendants of Jacob. Show him reverence, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not ignored or belittled the suffering of the needy. He has not turned his back on them, but has listened to their cries for help. I will praise you in the great assembly. 
I will fulfill my vows in the presence of those who worship you. The poor will eat and be satisfied. All who seek the Lord will praise him. Their hearts will rejoice with everlasting joy. The whole earth will acknowledge the Lord and return to him. All the families of the nations will bow down before him. For royal power belongs to the Lord. He rules all the nations. Let the rich of the earth feast and worship. Bow before him, all who are mortal, all whose lives will end as dust. Our children will also serve him. Future generations will hear about the wonders of the Lord. His righteous acts will be told to those not yet born. They will hear about everything he has done. Our so, prayer. Go right ahead. Our prayer of confession uh, today is as follows. Please join us with an attitude of prayer. A guiding Lord, even though we hesitated on our Lenten journey, we vowed to come with you through all the trials and fears toward the cross. Today, we face the challenge with which true commitment brings. Are we willing to offer our whole selves to you in service? We would like to think that we can do that, but we are aware of how many times we have turned away from service and instead focus on our own desires. Remind us again of the commitment you will have given if we are to become disciples. Forgive our stubbornness and fears. Lead us forward, gracious Lord, up these steps toward the cross. Amen. And friends, hear these words of assurance. The journey of discipleship is never easy, but you can be assured that you'll not be on this journey alone. Place your trust in Jesus. If we rely upon the law of God, we are beyond hope. But in God's mercy, we are declared righteous through our faith in Jesus, who died for our sins. Receive, therefore, the fullness of the grace of God. Amen. As Christ has forgiven us, we are to forgive others. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you too are forgiven. Praise to God who has triumphed gloriously. Amen. Amen. Our reading from the epistle is Romans chapter 4, verses 13 through 25. Clearly, God's promise to give the whole earth to Abraham and his descendants was based not on his obedience to God's law, but on a right relationship with God that comes by faith. If God's promise is only for those who obey the law, then faith is not necessary and the promise is pointless. For the law always brings punishment on those who try to obey it. The only way to avoid breaking the law is to have no law to break. So the promise is received by faith. It is given as a free gift. And we are all certain to, to receive it. Whether or not we live according to the law of Moses, if we have faith like Abraham's. For Abraham is the father of all who believe. That is what the scriptures mean when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. This happened because Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about a hundred years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead, and so was Sarah's womb. Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger, and in this he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do 
whatever he promises. And because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. And when God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was recorded for our benefit, too, assuring us that God will also count us as righteous if we believe in him, the one who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. He was handed over to die because of our sins, and he was raised to life to make us right with God. I invite you to join with us for a time of prayer. Lord, you know how so often we like instant things. We want our food prepared in an instant. We want our broken items repaired instantly. We want funds available to us the instant we ask for them. We want you to instantly respond to our needs. You have called us to be part of this journey, and this is not an instant trip of healing and hope. It will at times be difficult. We'll have to look deep inside ourselves to find the barriers that block our vision. Our expectations for instant gratification need to be broken down. These are walls we erect that keep us from really dealing with the hurts and sorrow of the world. We are not on a nice little trip to a special place where the roses bloom and the birds sing. We are on a journey in an arid and dusty place where rocks, snakes, and dry dust threaten our way. We are called to be those who would bear hope in such a place. Prepare us for this portion of this journey, Lord. Help us to be realistic. Help us to remember that the good we do, no matter how small it seems, is truly good in your sight. And empower us to work together for peace and harmony in your world. Draw us closer to you and help us to trust in you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The reading from the Gospel is Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. Then Jesus began to tell them that the Son of Man must suffer many terrible things and be rejected by the elders, the leading priest, and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but three days later he would rise from the dead. As he talked about this openly with his disciples, Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Jesus turned around and looked at his disciples then reprimanded Peter. Get away from me, Satan, he said. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Then, calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way and take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my message in these adulterous and sinful days, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This ends the lesson, the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As probably most of you are aware of by now, we're in the midst of a stewardship campaign. And it's a time to reflect on how we connect and how we relate really to all of creation, to planet Earth, to one another, to the community, to the church, and how we understand ourselves of stewards that God has placed us here now to be his hands and feet as we bring his word and his message to the world in many, many different ways. The scriptures today are often referred to as rather subtle and 
kind of a under the table way to get into stewardship. And when you read them initially, you often don't think about stewardship, but if you go back and look at them again, and these are the same readings that we'll be having on Sunday morning, they talk about stewardship in the sense that God is giving, God is giving, God is giving all the time. And you can kind of see God give and watch God give and let it go by and the world goes by, but the reality is that in all of these passages, God is asking for a response. God asked for a response from Abraham and Sarah, and it was to be a response of faith. God asked uh, in the Psalter for a response of a sense of is uh, community from the Israelites. And most profound is the reading that Daniel did just a moment ago, where Jesus says that the greatest commitment I can give is my life. And my life is going to be a sacrifice and is going to be the foundation of what creates a path to salvation. That's powerful. Again, God is giving. Jesus makes a response. But also, if you continue there, Jesus is expecting all of us to make a response too. And he really hits hard on Peter, in particular, in that reading. So far in our stewardship campaign, we've talked about what it means to be connected to one another. We've talked about community. Um, Pastor Daniel talked about faith last Sunday. And this Sunday in particular, we're going to be talking about resources. And I'm going to be very focused with you here because resources for today and for Sunday, we're thinking about what is our role in helping to support the church financially. There are many ways to think about stewardship. Money's only one, and we've talked about that. There's your prayers, your presence, uh, your attitude, your time, your talents, but there's also our resources, and we have to have resources to run a community of faith. And so I brought Rick in here today to give us all the answers to the issues around this. And so I'm going to give you his uh, email address and his phone number, and you can call him. But seriously, um, our attitude about resources does have an impact on the church. I can't talk with all of you directly. You're welcome to call Pastor Daniel or myself and share your points of view by phone call or on email. But when we speak of the cost of stewardship, we often talk about the cost of discipleship, but there's also the cost of stewardship, what it takes to keep a community of faith going financially. Rick, do you have any thoughts around that? Well, um, when I look at the, the, the church, um, we haven't been able to, to meet as a as a congregation for almost uh, getting close on close on a, onto a year, um, but that doesn't mean that the infrastructure stopped existing. Um, the last time, and I, I I remembered with the finance committee that there are sixteen HVAC units that go on the roof of this sanctuary that we are uh, sitting in. Uh, and I think we've replaced two of them, but they were installed in the 1980s. Yep. Okay. So that's part of the infrastructure that, need, that stewardship needs to uh, address. Uh, and that's, that, doesn't, that won't be addressed by anything less than money. I, I, that's just the way it is. Uh, our uh, obligations to uh, the... Uh, uh, Conference, our obligations to our staff, those are all going to be addressed by money. Um, but that's, I mean, that's just part and parcel of, of running a church. That's part and parcel mm -hmm. of running anything. That's right. Uh, if, so, If we were living in um, Montana or North Dakota, we'd have the issue of heating the building. Here we have the issue of cooling the building yes. unless there's going to be massive climate change in the next 12 months. Um, we'll be facing the same situation. We have to have money yeah. to, and to keep the infrastructure, as you say, going. Yes, and like I said, the, the, the staff and our commitments to the conference. Um, those are the three big things, I, I think. And um, 
donations to the church, uh, not donations, well, uh, uh, are probably the largest contributor to the, the cash flow. I'm, you know, uh, we have other things, but uh, the, the uh, uh, stewardship campaign probably goes to, I don't know, half or 60 percent of the uh, budget that we have to run the church. Yeah, that's so, right. That's right. So that's. Yeah. I mean, there's infrastructure needs and there's a needs to pay sal uh, salaries or um, you have to pay the help. That's what you, I'm saying. You, yeah, there's a lot of lot of people it takes to, to keep a church going like this. And also the the opportunities that we get uh, to participate in when we give, uh, such as being participants of the uh, greater missional outreach uh, through the giving that the church gets to do for various funds that support various different projects yeah. for homeless children or for education uh, and for, for instance, uh, with the Methodist Church, the UMCOR, United Methodist Committee on Relief. Yeah. That also provides the participation that we do, not only as a local congregation in our own local community, uh, but we also do it nationally and internationally. Right. right. That's right. And that's through, partly through apportionment and uh, so so that's where that goes to. Yeah, when we talk about apportionment, I guess that needs to be broken down to the population because apportionment doesn't may not make sense. Yeah. Well, we we somebody said we pay a a franchise tax, okay, um, to be a United Methodist. But what that really means is that every church is assessed a certain amount of of money uh, that goes to support. Um, well, some local events, but primarily um, events and activities and administrative functions of the broader church and of the annual conference. And this is a long established way that we do things, and many of you know about that. What less, lesser of you may understand is how much we pay. I think this past year we paid $117,000. Or was it more than that? I think it was one hundred and nine thousand. One hundred nine thousand yeah. dollars. That that was what we paid in apportionments. Yes. And we paid the whole amount. And I want to commend all of you. Yes. For participating in that, because if it wasn't for your giving, that would never that would never have happened. There are many churches right now that cannot pay all of their apportionments because um, because of the situation with COVID and and churches being shut down for one reason or another. Um, it has, the churches have not been able to generate the kind of resources to pay, to pay that. But, you know, in the best sense of the word, the expectation has always been in the United Methodist Church that the apportionments are the first thing that we pay. It's off the top. Um, it's a way of sacrificially really supporting um, the annual conference and the broader church. And it takes a real commitment of a church to plan to do that and to work that into its budget. But it's really not an optional thing. But even after that, then you start with the salaries of employees. And then you start with the buildings and the infrastructure. And as Rick pointed out, um, without exactly saying it, we have a huge infrastructure at this church. Yes. And um, what it takes to keep things going here uh, is not a low amount of, of money. And so I often ask people, do we talk too much about money or do we not talk enough about money? What do you think about that? Uh, um, my experience in 2013, uh, the first half of the year I was uh, appointed at a church in Las Vegas. And the second half I was transferred over here to Mesa, to another church here. and. With regards to the phrase of the cost of stewardship, we introduced in 2013 at, at the church here, at the other church that I was serving in Mesa, we introduced um, the online giving. And in 2014, it was still struggling to take off. And we soon realized that the things that we didn't understand were, for instance, one of them was that those people, a lot of the people that were faithful givers that would mm -hmm. tithe and mm -hmm. give an offering and what have you, <clears throat> they felt uh, uh, 
a bit embarrassed and almost a sense of guilt when the offering plate was uh, coming by the right. aisle because they were already participants of the unlike giving. Mm -hmm. But yeah. they weren't putting anything on the plate. So, so it looked like they were not giving. Yeah. Exactly. For... So the cost of stewardship taught us new things. How do we participate with allowing the availability um, of online giving, but at the same time, how do we deal with the reality of removing that sense of guilt because the offering plate is being passed down and those individuals are not giving, namely my wife and I. We were <laughs> yeah. some of those. Yeah. So uh, m m we came up with the idea that what we were going to do is that we created these little cards that said, I give online. And they could pick those up at the entrance of the worship service so that they would be able to put something on the offering plate. And that taught us such a great lesson that the cost of, of stewardship is ongoing. We continue to learn how we can continue to help in so many different ways. Just one little card like that, that we were able to offer the individuals that were already giving online, but they're feeling that they're, per, that they're putting something on the plate. Uh, that's uh, that's really great. That's that's something we could certainly do here, because many people do give online, yes. or yeah. they give. Some people just write checks out and bring it by once a month and bring it by the office, and that's not true. everybody's putting it in the plate. And, and my wife Deb, you know, because mine is just taken automatically off the top of my salary, so I never put anything in the in the plate. And she says I always feel so weird when I come to church. And they're taking up the offering, and I'm just sitting there looking around, and you know, <laughs> maybe I just need to pray, you know, <laughs> during that time. So there is that sense of almost embarrassment. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But the idea of a stewardship campaign being done when it is now, and then tying into a budget. I mean, you need to know because these are pledged. That's right. Resources. Good point. So, so it has to be done at a certain time to so that a church can know how much they can spend. Yeah, and, and that's, I'm really glad you mentioned that because in the next week, you are, all are going to be receiving. In fact, the next few days, you're going to be re receiving an envelope um, that has Belderos, United Methodist Church in the upper left, and your name on the front. Do not throw that envelope away, all right? Please open it. And that has a letter that we want you to read and also uh, an invitation to make a pledge um, a commitment for the upcoming year. And Rick, you're right, it's helpful when we have that so we can plan a budget, so we can look down the road. It's really hard to plan a budget when we have no idea what's coming in. And of course, with COVID and not being able to be in worship, this yes. is kind of gonna be a readjustment for us. So our stewardship is important this year and it's important for all of you to, to participate. Rick, what would you say to, to our congregation um, that perhaps you haven't said? I don't want to leave anything unsaid here that well, you might have on your heart or mind. I'm trying to figure out how to say this. The, uh, I, I was watching a television program, and it had um, it was a, a regular talk show or something like that. It had Jimmy Carter on it. And Jimmy Carter was in his 80s at the time, and he had just came back from Africa. And he would, was distributing some kind of membrane. And the membrane was a filter for groundwater. And it took a lot of the antibodies or whatever out of it that were causing illnesses out of there. Mm. And the commentator asked him, where do you do this? You're in your 80s. Can't you just settle down? And he said, I'm a Christian, and that's what we do. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. It, I, I, uh, and it wasn't a Christian program either. I mean, it was just yeah. like a Tonight Show or something. I couldn't remember what it was. But. That's a great witness to give. Which means we are to care yeah. about people and yes. make a difference in the world. Yes. Well, that's what, that's what we're tasked to do as Christians. Yes. Yeah. I was a part of the Connectional Table uh, for two years um, in the earlier 2000s. And when Katrina happened, I was so proud to have learned that UMCOR, the United Methodist Committee on Relief, showed up to Katrina with their airplanes and their supplies and what have you, even before the government made its presence. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's what we do as United Methodists. Mm -hmm. 
um, because of our stewardship that we give an opportunity for in the local congregation, we're able to also make an impact nationally and internationally. Right. And you're right, UMCOR often is on the ground with boots before more formal organizations have a chance to mobilize mm -hmm. and come into a situation. Where malaria has been, that's been the case. Yes. Where there's been earthquakes and floods and tsunamis, UMCOR tries to be a first response organization. And they make a difference in people's lives. I think, I think in the end, what we would like to do is for all of us to be challenged. Not only congregation, but us sitting here before you today to all be challenged to look again at our commitment to Christ. And we're not going to walk a road most likely exactly like Jesus did. It's not going to lead to a cross. But friends, we are all walking a road that leads us to serve our Lord Jesus Christ. And that may challenge you to serve in many, many different ways in the church. But the point is serve, find your niche, make your contribution. And it can be in so many different ways. We need you and the church needs you. And right now, of course, we need your financial support as well as your gifts and graces in many other areas. Daniel, you want to add anything to that? Finish out? No, I think that um, what Pastor Larry uh, mentioned, um, I, w I guess I would add something to it, which would be that um, I view the concept of stewardship with, with my financial resources uh, with one word. I get to participate in that area of stewardship. And for me, I find it with a lot of freedom to be able to experience that. Um, I continue to always try to teach that to my three sons as well, that we get to give unto the Lord by giving at the local church. Well said. So stewardship is not a burden to be born, but a gift of God that empowers us to participate mm -hmm. in kingdom building. Any last word? I think I've, no, okay. I, I think I've said <laughs> enough. I, I don't. All right. Daniel, lead us in the Lord's Prayer, please, as we come to our finished point. <laughs> Let us in gratitude and thanksgiving join together in saying the prayer that Jesus taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Before we have the benediction, Rick, thank you for joining with us today. It's been delightful to have you with us. Thank you, Rick. You're welcome. And friends, please tune in with us on Sunday morning for our 930 service and continue the Lenten journey with us. And now Pastor Daniel and I will conclude with our benediction. Place your trust in God's guidance. Go into this world that is in such need of hope and healing with the love of Christ in your hearts. Though the journey is long, God will sustain you. So go in peace, and may God's peace always go with you. Teach us the profound truth that all you have given to us belongs to you already. Help us to let go and give your blessings to others, joyfully and intentionally. Go in God's grace. Amen. And amen. Have a great day.